Thanks very much for joining us. Um, as you know, we are FEDSA, Front End Development South Africa. We are a nonprofit as of very recently. Um, we were CT Feds, Cape Town Front End Developers, but now we've formed this umbrella organization for front end development, and we hope to be, have more of a kind of national presence. Um, obviously, we've moved all our meetings, meet, meetups online um, as of last year for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, while on the one hand, we, you kind of miss uh, meeting people in person, it also allows us to uh, a lot more scope in the kinds of speakers we can have. Um, and um, it's a lot easier for people to join as well, I think, um, assuming they have the the bandwidth capabilities to do so, which isn't always the case in South Africa. But uh, we do record uh, all these talks and then we, we put them all up on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, so uh, for this evening, we are doing a, a three presentations on accessibility. Um, every year we do a, a, a meetup that coincides with Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is an international uh, well, an organization that organizes uh, accessibility events around the world. Okay? And they're all supposed to happen on the third Thursday of May, which is today. So um, today is actually Global Accessibility Awareness Day um, <laughs> around the globe. And there are, you know, I, I looked on the site yesterday and there are dozens of events happening all over the world, which is really, really great. I remember when we first started doing this many, many years ago, there were lots of events, but not nearly the amount that we have now. So that's a really good sign for accessibility on a global scale. Right, so we've got three uh, presenters today. Um, Skog Fenter, um, co-founder and organizer of, of FEDSA, um, who will be uh, taking us through just uh, some kind of theoretical introduction to accessibility. Uh, then we have Kate Whitaker who is uh, joining us, who is an accessibility practitioner, and she's going to talk to us about, you know, real world experiences with uh, uh, trying to get people to do accessibility. Um, I'm sure the good and also the painful will be included. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'll end off just uh, talking about how we bake accessibility into our front end development practices at, the, at my company. Okay, oh, and I see, did I see that? Have we just been joined by Jenison? Yes, we have. <laughs> uh, Jenison is the organizer of Global Accessibility Awareness Day and one of the co-founders. So we're super happy to have him here popping in. Um, welcome. You're on mute. Oh, good evening, everyone. Happy, uh, happy gal. I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I, and I, I have to tell you, so I'm completely blind. I'm not sure if you're looking at my ceiling, my chest, or my face. Your mouth. We're looking at <laughs> half your face. <laughs> there we go. I, I, I look forward uh, in the not too distant future to hopping on a plane and coming to South Africa. I now have an excuse because I have uh, uh, brothers and sisters in arms and all of you who care about uh, accessibility and inclusive design. So I just want to wish everyone a happy GAD on behalf of Joe Devin and myself. Um, if I could for a, a quick moment, I just mention one exciting thing that mm -hmm. we've done today. Uh, we have announced, Joe and I, uh, the launch of the, the GAD Foundation. And if everyone takes a minute to go to gad.foundation, that's G-A-A-D, that foundation, you can learn all about what we want to do, what our plans are next to bring GAD uh, to the next level. The, the GAD itself isn't going anywhere, so you folks have to keep uh, celebrating every year. But we hope you'll join us on our next journey, which is the foundation. And essentially, what we want to do is we want to disrupt the product development life cycle so that accessibility becomes a core requirement. Uh, <laughs> Gone are the days, gone are the days where it's just about security and privacy. We want accessibility to be a first class citizen uh, because there are so many reasons and, uh, to, to make things accessible. And it's not only for folks like myself who are, who are permanently have a disability or impairment. There are people with situational disabilities, uh, people with temporary disabilities and people, again, like myself, who are getting old 
and body parts are not working where they used to. So we need to we need to really think more holistically when we're talking about accessibility. And I understand everyone here. You're you're all converted, right? Because you're here, and so you yeah. know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but we we want the mission and vision of the GAD Foundation to be breathed by all of you folks in South Africa. So will you join me on this on this next chapter, will you? Oh, yes. Awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. We're in. Awesome. And I want, I want like, I, I want to know when I get there, where am I going? Am I going to Cape Town? Am I going to Joburg? Where, is everyone from all over the place in South Africa uh, in this meetup? Awesome. Johannesburg. Um, here we go, Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> Cape Town. Cape Town. Cape Town. Cape Town. There's, a, there's like a nonstop. I'm from India. There's like a nonstop flight to Cape Town from Newark. There is, yes. It's got I'm no like, excuse. You think I'm kidding? You think I'm kidding? I'm not. I'm gonna come there. Just, uh, just brace yourself for the weather, uh, especially tonight in Cape Town. Uh, last night as well. It was a, uh, was a rough, rough storms. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, um, it's a, it's amazing uh, that you folks uh, are, are are doing stuff around this. You know, we talked, we've been talking about the importance of Global Accessibility Awareness Day being capital G global. Mm. Um, you know, uh, whether it's it's doing this in English. Uh, I'm not sure if you folks have any. Uh, conversations in Afrikaans or, or any other languages, right? That we're, we, need to, we need to be spreading the word about accessibility in all the different languages that people speak um, so that we get it. Um, we, I know we're uploading more languages onto our own Global Accessibility Awareness Day website. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be quiet now because I have a feeling I've just disrupted <laughs> you. Know. So I'm gonna listen in. I'm gonna listen in for a few minutes and see what you guys are up to. <laughs> not at all. Thanks. Thanks so much for dropping by and uh, just introducing yourself to us. And yeah, we, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier in our introduction, you know, we've been doing uh, guard days for a number of years now, and um, they're only just getting bigger and bigger. So mm. we definitely, uh, you know, with you on this on this uh, journey to making accessibility a given in what we do and not an, just an add on. Mm. Mm. Cool. Right. But, yeah. Let's let's get things started. Oh. Uh, I uh, we have a lot to go. Like we have a lot of speakers tonight. Uh, we have a lot to cover. So let's uh, maybe get into it. So let me actually just check if I can get my slides. Um, ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, so let me just share my screen. I'm going to do the, um, the, can you see my screen thingy? Can you see my screen? We can. All right. Okay. So Okay. So let's uh, do this thing. So um, let me just adjust everything here on my side. Cool. So uh, let's talk about uh, accessibility. So accessibility is one of those things that it's it's kind of like such a big topic to broach. It's it, it's so there's so many dimensions to um, actually starting a discussion on accessibility. So um, for those of you that are kind of quite involved in the world of accessibility, um, who've done a lot of work within accessibility and so forth. Um, some of these might be familiar, you might know kind of like there might be specific aspects that are more important to you or more interesting to you. Um, it's always kind of for me like a, a hard topic to um, kind of start with because, um, you know, I also, I also teach students, um, I uh, teach actually kind of a range of topics from, you know, product design to actual like straight up like JavaScript coding and so forth and, and all of those kind of tend to like touch on accessibility in some manner. And, and I think that's kind of one of the problems with accessibility um, and why it's such a, why, you know, we're struggling with it like so much just globally is because it's such an all encompassing process. It's not something that you can just distill down and say, it's this person's job. 
so I obviously don't know like all of your backgrounds and so forth. I don't know which parts are going to be applicable to you. So I'm going to try and speak about accessibility very broadly. And I, I think then Justin and Kate can maybe dive a bit more into the details, maybe show the concrete things. Um, so with that in mind, you know, like these are just four things I just quickly want to touch on. So um, I just want to uh, touch on, um, you know, why do we even care? You know, why why are we even here tonight? Um, why are we even talking about accessibility? Um, and then I just want to touch on kind of like the law, specifically within South Africa and so forth, and like kind of the legal aspect. Um, and then uh, Justin spoke about it quickly as well. Um, you know, this concept of like bolted on solutions, like um, thinking about accessibility as an afterthought, um, just my general thoughts on that. And then I just want to give a very, very brief description of kind of my approach and my uh, tool chain and so forth. Um, but as mentioned, Justin, Kate is going to go deeper into that, you know, so let's start talking about like why even care why even talk about accessibility um i think a lot of things within product design within development uh, within you know uh, even if it's like kind of ui design or more traditional just html and css and all of those things more often than not like the reason why we talk about topics is so that we grow in our career um so that we can take on more work we can do work better we can kind of provide better quality products and usually those translate you know if we're being very cynical into making more money so you know a lot of the times you know that's kind of the angle that we come from when we're like learning a new skill learning about something learning about this new framework or whatever it's kind of like career potential um accessibility is a bit different um and let's maybe just start where all of this tech nonsense, this web nonsense, all of this started. So some of you might know who this guy is. Um, and he knows quite a bit about the internet. Uh, he said that the power of the web is in its universality, um, specifically the fact that it's accessible by everyone, regardless of disability. Um, it's an essential aspect of the web. Um, and this is a direct quote. Um, so some of you might know who this is. This is uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, essentially the guy that created the internet. So I would say that, you know, his opinion on the matter um, is probably worth something. Um, but let me just move myself here so that I don't go over the slides. But, you know, like, let's look at some other things. So there's a really phenomenal book that came out last year. Uh, we, um, I'm actually on a panel next week um, where we're actually talking about like ethics in product design and so forth. And I think a lot of my opinions are informed by this specific book uh, written by three individuals. Um, it's called the Ethical Design Handbook. They very much kind of delve into like a lot of concepts related to um, how we kind of approach our work as practitioners. Um, and obviously, you know, I think a lot of us aren't very satisfied with where things are heading uh, for various reasons, accessibility being one of them, uh, things around privacy and, and, and so forth, you know, there's definitely a lot of room for us to be better. Um, so they generally do a call to kind of rethink how we approach projects. Um, and they specifically say that, you know, we can think about things like accessibility as things that we do out of fear of like bad reputation or lawsuit or fines, or we can do it from kind of a place of conviction, you know, and, and, and conviction to be what they would consider to be a reasonable person. Um, so to be someone who's reasonable, to be someone who respects other people, who values other people. Um, so and this is kind of, and they kind of divide this up into two things. Uh, so they say, you know, um, being reasonable um, speaks to kind of how you conduct yourself as a practitioner. So the way you do research, the way you interact with clients, you know, um, the way you think about the environmental impact of the things that you're building um, and so forth. Um, but then they also say, you know, there's another aspect, you know, that's, that's less uh, direct. And that's kind of like, um, the way we create products and kind of a more indirect relationship than the direct stakeholders that we're working with, you know. Um, 
like do we respect the people that use them and and i think they kind of say they kind of boil it down to this specific thing do we respect the people that use our products um and they essentially call for us to like grow grow our products and then grow the things that we build from a principle of fairness and fundamental respect and i think that's essentially what it comes down to um you know because i think within the world of accessibility speaking for myself it, it requires one to be a bit proactive um there aren't always readily available answers and immediately easy quick answers. Uh, uh, there are low hanging fruit, but a lot of the times the answer is it depends. And it requires a bit of you in terms of like asking people. Um, I think my golden rule is, you know, if I don't know, maybe see if I can reach out to someone who maybe has some kind of like problem that would be related to what would prevent a design from being accessible. And maybe just asking them like, hey, what do you think? Um, but then, you know, there are some of us that are maybe not as um, driven by just, you know, like there is a tension within all of us, um, myself as well. I tend to have behavior that's selfish and so forth. I'm not always someone that always cares about everyone else. So um, sometimes we need a bit of, you know, motivation for a bit more selfish reasons. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, but first and foremost, they, before we get into that, they say that, you know, uh, one reason why we need to talk about accessibility is the stakes are, um, increasing, you know, um, I'm going to directly read the quote and that is that companies, organizations, and the public sector, um, also become online services so much so that everything we do is to a greater or lesser extent, digital activities. So. You know, if you think um, in South Africa, e-filing, all of those things, um, I pay even pay like my traffic fines online through something like um, uh, Pay City. Um, I remember when I was a student um, to buy prepaid power, I needed to go to the garage around the corner and actually buy it with cash there. Um, and then get a kind of a slip and a number and I entered it. And nowadays I just use my phone, uh, go into my banking app and just get like a token for prepaid electricity. More and more things that are beyond the realm of just corporate and um, consumption and so forth are moving into the world of online. So I think the stakes are increasing where we're starting to um, get what would be considered civic technology so things related to you know interacting with municipal services interacting with um, provincial or national government and so forth so um, then that's completely different from someone not being able to order a pizza or you know get uh, like a, something from take a lot or so forth and i think even now with COVID, like that's probably actually becoming more of an issue now you have an actual real reason why you would um, consider online shopping essential and not just a luxury um, and they also just say you know in some countries you can even get a divorce online um, which is in a way the most impersonal way to end the most personal relationship you can have uh, with another human being so i spoke about like kind of maybe more selfish reasons and for me, one of them is definitely um, investing in my own future. You know, I, we are probably going to be one of the first generations who are going to use the internet and kind of all the tech that we have going today, hopefully until the day we die. I would love to still be able to use the internet until the end of my life. I would not... Um, I think it would be very sad for me if I ever reach a point where I'm just like, cool, like I, I, I just can't use the internet anymore. Uh, that part of my life is over. Um, I just need to make peace with that. Um, yeah, now it's just, I don't know, crossword puzzles or whatever. The thing is we age and um, I would still, and you know, as we age kind of our needs in terms of accessibility increase. Um, and I personally would like to um, still use the internet uh, even into my old age so I think like if you want to look at more selfish reasons like maybe today start building the type of culture that's going to result in that being the case when I kind of hopefully touch wood uh, reach old age um, 
yeah, so this is also a phenomenal book called uh, A Web for Everyone. Uh, it is a bit dated nowadays, um, but it's still like for me, I still consider it one of the best like resources in terms of just um, general like introdu an introduction to accessibility. Um, and they essentially just say, you know, um, when uh, we retire, um, over 30% of us will have some disability, even if it's minor. So then, for those that are even more selfish, um, I sometimes also need this bit of like, kind of push to do the right thing. Um, and that is the legal side of things, you know. Um, so unfortunately, currently, we don't necessarily have the rigorous, um, like, penal like um, systems and codes and things that you maybe have like within the world of building and construction and, and those type of things. Um, there isn't really um, like building like building codes in the way you would have within the world of engineering for websites. Um, but like so they um, they kind of speculation is that we will start seeing that at some point i'm not sure how i feel about this i hope that is the case um but yeah i guess we'll see um but you know like usually when i make this point people are like oh crap you know like i like how am i going to deal with this and i always also make the distinction that you know uh, the, the stakes are different you know if you have a spaza shop on the corner selling knickknacks or whatever um like the, the the like the municipal services is going to come down on you because you don't have a wheelchair ramp or whatever if you are opening a library or you're opening like a hotel or a hospital or something um, in the city center and you don't have a wheelchair ramp that is a completely different question uh, so you know we also should be mindful of that you know we can't uh, all of us like are different like at different places in our careers and sometimes we do stupid things and we build things in ways that are not accessible um the last thing i want is for accessibility to be a club that we hit one another over the head with uh, that doesn't mean that those that kind of need to care about these things should be absolved from responsibility but i think we should be careful of weaponizing accessibility that's something i see quite a bit so let's quickly just talk about the law i don't want to spend too much time on this but i think it's worth a mention um, so, talking about the letter of the law, the South African Constitution, as you guys know, is very, very clear in terms of inclusivity and so forth. So, it's actually like a very pro-accessibility legal framework, you know, um, insofar that it says no person may unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly. I think that's something we don't always realize, that within the South African legal system, discrimination is something that can happen indirectly um on one or more grounds in terms of disability national legislation must be enacted to prevent or prohibit unfair discrimination um so then in 2000 there was also the equality act that was passed that kind of like fleshed out a bit more what we mean by um you know discrimination and it defines discrimination um as an act or a mission and I think once again, that is important. We, we tend to think of discrimination as a proactive thing that you do. You discriminate against someone. We don't tend to think about discrimination as an omission, something that we forget, something that we don't intentionally do, something that we don't consider. Um, and But the law is very clear in terms of that still counts as discrimination. Um, and it makes two distinctions. It says, you know, the one side is burdening um, providing uh, burdening or putting obligations or disadvantages on someone. So kind of like a negative approach, but then there's also like withholding benefits and opportunities. Um, it, the law also considers that discrimination. Uh, so the South African legal system actually has a very wide definition of discrimination. I think, which is once again, very pro accessibility, but as you all know, in South Africa, despite our constitution, like our track record is not the greatest. Um, so just even looking to things like cyber crimes and whatever, um, we still have a very far way to go um, in terms of even just addressing things like cyber crimes. Uh, I actually was, so some of you might know, I was actually a victim of identity theft 
about three years ago. Uh, to this day, I'm still struggling with a lot of effects of it. And I think I came face to face with just like how there's no protection um, for any anyone in South Africa when it comes to those type of things, like impersonation and, you know, so like even like if we don't really have the, the structures in place to deal with those type of things, um, what does that even say about something like accessibility? And to a certain degree, I can understand, you know, we are a country that have, you know, some societal problems that need addressing um, and we have a history that you can't deny. So I think just in terms of uh, triage and um, where resources get spent, I can to a certain degree understand why accessibility isn't exactly at the top of priorities uh, on a political and governmental level, but you know that doesn't mean it's not important or that we shouldn't advocate for it. Um, but I think like we shouldn't expect um, a lot of progress from the government side. Um, I would love to be proven wrong, but I think that's just kind of the context that I'm working in. Um, but, you know, when looking across the waters, um, there does seem to be a lot of movement. And I'm hoping that it's just a case of us lagging a bit behind. Uh, I do definitely feel that the only way we're going to solve the problem of accessibility is by actually having some type of external pressure, whether that's legal or, you know, whether that's a carrot or a stick approach. Um, I think uh, it has become clear to me that we can't help have the tech industry itself just police itself when it comes to accessibility. Um, so essentially, you know, 2017, uh, first federal lawsuit in America happened. Um, and it was essentially someone who couldn't use a screen reader on a supermarket chain, uh, and they essentially won. And um, since then, there's kind of been a bit of an upward trend, um, you know, like lots of uh, lawsuits, um, kind of because that essentially kind of set a bit of a precedent um, upon which other lawsuits were based. Um, and I think this is a good thing, you know, um, I think it's a good thing. Um, we definitely see this type of thing like in the world of you know once again access to buildings and and, and so forth um and i think it's about time that we treat something like the web um, with as much importance as we treat the physical space in which we kind of interact with one another and so forth um yeah i, I saw that tanya just mentioned like something quickly there and uh, for those of you that don't know um Tanya is like quite involved in the world of uh, accessibility, specifically within kind of the, the public sector sphere. sphere. So um, I am super excited to have like hear some discussion from her side afterwards. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. Um, cool, let's quickly chat about bolted solutions. Um, so some of you might know this guy. If you don't follow him on Twitter, uh, like he, has some of the best tweets. <laughs> it's about 50% serious stuff, 50% memes. Uh, so he has actually uh, done a couple of talks uh, with uh, Fed Sub before as well, so uh, Rory Freddy. Uh, he is a developer advocate at Microsoft, um, and he is what you would call a little person. Um, and on the right-hand side here is actually a photo of his car. So essentially, he has a bolted on solution for his car. So he has a regular car, like you and me. Um, he didn't get a special car. Uh, he has a regular car and uh, it was essentially extended uh, so that he can use it more easily. Um, and I think this is something yeah, I saw William mention from Microsoft. Did I not mention that? Okay, but anyway, he's from Microsoft. <laughs> it is here in this slide. Um, but yeah, phenomenal guy. Um, I really encourage you guys to um, follow him on Twitter. Um, but, you know, and I think sometimes we're not honest about the fact that um, sometimes bolted on solutions work. You know, that is a fact. I, I think we, in an ideal world, uh, we would like to build everything with um, kind of an inclusive approach from the ground up. But unfortunately, the reality is even those of us that work within the product design sphere, um, you know, you, 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 you start working with products in certain parts of their life cycle, 
Um, sometimes you come in at certain points and there isn't budget to just re redesign the entire product from the ground up. And you need to work with an existing product. And sometimes you just need to bolt things on to just make it incrementally better at this point in time. And I think there are instances where that works. Uh, one of it is uh, subtitles. Um, and as someone who, I can definitely say, as someone whose dishwasher is very close to the TV, um, while subtitles might not have initially been created for someone like me, even I get a lot of benefit from it um, when it's needed. And I think subtitles are like one of those cases where a bolted on solution like works really well. Um, then there are cases where it doesn't work that well. Um, and, you know, that is essentially something like this, where you end up with a solution where everyone's just dissatisfied. Um, probably, I, I, think un, I think unsatisfied is maybe an understatement for um, how you'd feel if you use that with a wheelchair. I guess maybe fearing for your life is maybe a bit closer. Um, but I think even people that would just use a regular stairs would be unsatisfied with this solution. Like now it's kind of ruining it for everyone. And this is a very clear case where it wasn't built like with this in mind. And then at some point someone realized that, oh no, we forgot about this thing. We need to make it accessible. What can we do? How, what can we do extra? Um, and I think the important thing here is that um, we should be careful when the default approach to accessibility is bolting things on. Um, I think like there are cases where bolting things on, like given the circumstances work, add value, um, but that shouldn't be our go-to. And our go-to should be to think of accessibility of a, as a quality. Things have an inherent accessibility to them. It's not something extra that you put on top of uh, something else. Um, so actually our entire approach has a specific accessibility quality to it. So it's a spectrum, you know, and I often use this example where, you know, even in terms of the solutions to access some accessibility problems actually benefit a range of users, you know, so color contrast, you know, so apart from actual, um, you know, um, like, visual impairments. Um, it's also helpful for people who, if you're standing outside and it's a sunny day and you have a lot of screen glare, um, having a site with a high enough color contrast is gonna be helpful. Uh, if you're like me and you struggle to sleep at night and you have a blue light filter, then um, you'll definitely like agree that sometimes if the color contrast is too low on a site, it's hard to see, especially with that red uh, tint over keyboard only, you know, the same from like someone who has Parkinson's all the way down to if you're using like an old Kindle device that obviously doesn't have a touch screen that just has arrows or even something as simple as if you're eating a sandwich with one hand and you just have one free hand, you know, um, same for blindness, um, semantic structure. Um, what's generally good for people who use screen readers is generally good for Google as well, because Google doesn't have eyes. It uses the exact same interface that a screen reader uses. Um, so, you know, once again, you know, if you're looking for more selfish reasons, then what's generally good for screen readers is generally good for SEO as well. And then just things around predictability, um, you know, from ADHD to people just being rushed for time and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, and once again, you know, this, this concept of not approaching accessibility as a last minute checklist. Um, and that's kind of, you know, essentially, you know, I think I almost almost paraphrased this by saying, you know, it, it results in a product that's un, unsatisfying for both the designer and the user. Um, so, you know, on the right hand side, we have a much more elegant solution. And this is definitely a case where good design is invisible, uh, bad design is visible. So you might not even think about the right-hand side solution as like um, something that's specifically accessible. Um, you might just see it as a specific solution as one possible alternative to other ways that it could have been done. Um, and I think this is the key here. Um, one of the reasons why we don't necessarily talk about accessibility that much is that 
we don't actually see that much when it's done well because it tends to be invisible but i think this is a clear indication where just thinking about your approach to the project and how you're building it um by baking it in like it almost once again becomes it becomes invisible um and so some of you might know this chap uh, Steve, he's now in New Zealand. They are actually um, doing their own um, GAAD event tonight as well. Well, I guess it was tonight there a couple of hours ago, so they're probably all asleep right now. Um, but they also had one. Um, so he actually used to be part of what is now known as Front End Development South Africa. Um, he's definitely my go to person in terms of accessibility and, and I think uh, he has mentioned something that's really I found really profound and that is you know accessibility is broken by bad decisions not created by good ones HTML by itself is accessible and it's by design you know it's when we try and do something fancy or custom that we break it so to me accessibility is more about what we don't do you know, as opposed to what we actually actively do. So it's less about like proactively making something accessible and more about avoiding bad decisions. And, you know, a good example of this is this website, which some of you might know um, for various reasons. I'm not going to pronounce the name of the website. Uh, essentially, it just comes down to um, that uh, you know, HTML by itself is, is accessible. It's responsive, it's accessible. Um, you know, it's like super SEO friendly. It's when we try and do fancy things on top of that, that we actually end up breaking all of those things. Um, just one word of warning, when you actually do approach accessibility as a um, add on a bolted on solution, just make sure that the solution itself isn't actually even worse than the problem is trying to solve. So here I have two examples of bolted on solutions. Uh, you know, even as an able bodied user, um, I find the right hand side one like just, I almost feel like I need an instruction manual just on how to use that one. So just be mindful of that. Don't make it the problem worse. Um, and then when you bolt things on, you know, um, think about how you do that. Like, can you maybe do it as an enhancement? So some of you might know this movie uh, called Scott Pilgrim versus the, versus the World. Um, they actually do quite a nice thing where uh, in a lot of instances, they include sound effects, um, the, what would generally be the um, subtitle. Um, actually as a visual element in the movie. Um, and I understand the reason being because it's kind of based on a comic book and so forth, but I found it to be a very interesting approach. Um, there's another one, uh, which is kind of a really movie, a good movie that I really like. Um, it's kind of a Russian movie. Um, so uh, I think the English version is called Nightwatch. Um, so obviously they included subtitles. Um, and but they did it in such an interesting way that um you know they included in the movie and it actually enhances the movie you know it, it, it kind of speaks to the kind of aesthetics the movement it kind of makes the movie more expressive so you know like i always say you know think are there ways in which you can if you want to bolt things on maybe add it as an enhancement that kind of makes it better experience generally for all the users um yeah so I think also just generally um, in terms of empathy and so forth, um, think just about the times where you were frustrated, um, design, like using a service. Maybe you tried to submit a form and it didn't want to submit or you tried doing your e-filing or, or whatever, you know, trying to upload an image and it kind of just keeps on breaking and, and kind of use that experience, channel that experience in terms of um what it would be what the general experience is of someone that kind of um, is using a web that isn't necessarily at the point in terms of accessibility where the web should be um and then just quickly i just want to mention um my general tools and testing uh so i um very much look to something called the WCAG, 
WCAG. Uh, so it's a web content and accessibility guideline. Uh, it's an extremely technical document. So take this from someone who enjoys reading the uh, HTML and CSS specification. Um, so it's an extremely technical document. It's very comprehensive. Uh, if you enjoy technical things, uh, give it a read. But um, for the rest of us, uh, there is something called um, the A. 11Y project, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so things are generally um, placed in A, double A, or triple A. I'm sure Justin or Kate will touch on this a bit. Um, a is essentially, you know, it can be summarized as, you know, it doesn't meet minimum accessibility uh, requirements. Double A means kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of accessible, um, but, you know, like there is room for improvement. Um, and then AAA is just essentially uh, ideal, where we should be. If you want to provide the best uh, possible accessibility, um, then you should aim for AAA. But for various reasons, sometimes we might want to settle for AA, and I guess that's fine. You know, um, the same. We kind of take the same approach to browsers. You know, you might not want to provide full feature parity for Internet Explorer, but um, at the very least, just make sure that someone who uses Internet Explorer can maybe get the core value out of your product. Even if it's a frustrating and not enjoyable experience, if there's an emergency and that's all they have at their disposal, uh, maybe they can just like get the, do the thing in some manner. Um, then there's another thing called uh, ARIA, uh, which I'm sure Justin will speak about as well. Um, and this is just additional information that we include um, in our HTML to provide more accessibility context. Interestingly enough, there was a survey at one point that actually pointed out that websites that use ARIA labels tend to be worse when it comes to accessibility. Um, we should be careful there to not confuse causation and correlation. I think it's correlation. So I think it's usually you would use ARIA labels when you're already doing a lot of like funky things accessibility wise. Um, <clears throat> but I just found it interesting that um, the, the sites that use ARIA labels tended to be worse when it comes to accessibility. But obviously, if you if you use it correctly, it can definitely improve accessibility. Um, so then I quickly spoke about uh, A11Y. Uh, so A11Y is one of those things people like speculate about what it means and there's like some really profound um, reasons for that name and people say like, yeah, this is how it would look. You know, it's, it's obscured because that's how the internet is to someone with accessibility needs or, you know, it like it kind of almost looks like ally and whatever and uh, you know what it essentially comes down to is it, it, it comes from twitter and accessibility is one of those words that take up a massive part of your character count um so if you use the word accessibility three times you already used up a lot of characters so people just swapped out uh, the actual little letter 11 uh, between the a and the y instead of um, the 11 characters that actually go there. Uh, they do the same with like I18N and L10N and, and so forth. Um, so there's a really great project called the A11Y project. Um, they did a complete redesign last year. Um, and like it is kind of, I consider it my accessibility Bible. If you are new to the world of accessibility, if this is the first time you're hearing about accessibility, check out this project. It is like the place to start your journey. Uh, it has like software, books, blogs, podcasts, like everything. It, it's amazing. And as mentioned, they did a complete redesign last year. Um, so then just the last slide uh, before I hand over to Justin and Kate. Um, so my general rule of thumb is I kind of break things down into three uh, categories. So to me, the only real currency, as it should always be in product design, is real users. Uh, you know, everything else is speculation. So you should always aim for, like, first prize should always be talking to real users who have impairments, talking to real users that maybe are deaf, or maybe have uh, fine motor skill problems, or so forth, you know, that should always take precedence. Everything else should be treated with a certain degree of skepticism. But, you know, budgets are 
going to budget, timelines are going to do what timelines do, and sometimes we just don't have the ability to do that. Um, then, you know, like uh, you can definitely do some self testing. Um, there's a phenomenal website called Empathy Prompts, which just gives you like these random things to do to kind of uh, gain more empathy, understanding in terms of the challenges that people face um, when using products. Um, but like some of these might be just trying to navigate the web with only your keyboard, you know, uh, forcibly using it, like using your phone in an environment that has extreme glare. Um, this is a fun one. Um, like usually um, this is one I don't really see people do when they're working in the office space, but, you know, try using your keyboard with mittens on, you know, um, and things like, you know, just blurring your eyesight and so forth. There's also nothing stopping, there's nothing stopping any of us from actually using screen readers, uh, especially when like a lot of browsers actually now have a lot of that built in. And I think then lastly, um, there's also, you know, the option of digital emulation. Uh, a lot of operating systems have a grayscale mode that you can just switch on. Um, you know, there's things like color contrast checker. Uh, there's a very interesting called the uh, interesting tool called the Dyslexia Simulator, um, and so forth. Yeah, you know, so these are generally how I organize things. But oftentimes, to me, accessibility is one of those things where it's, it's, a, it's a journey of a thousand steps, you know, you start somewhere, and you need to be patient with yourself. And I, I think we as people within the industry need to be patient with one another as well. We're, we're figuring this out, like, we're not gonna get it perfect from the get go, especially when there isn't really a culture around accessibility in the industry at large. You know, we're kind of figuring it out as we go and, and we need to be patient with one another and patient with mm -hmm. each other. So with that being said, um, Justin, I don't know whether you maybe want to do some quick Q&A now or whether you just want to move on to the next thing and uh, we do like one big Q&A at the end. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I think let's do one big one at the end. Let's go. Um, essentially, yeah, I was going to ask, um, I, well, this is a very rapidly produced thing. So that I was going to ask people what, where you work or what sectors you work in. Uh, My background is, yeah. So I, can, I can quickly start up that poll if you want. Um, I um, saw you sent yeah, that to it's, me. It's not so critical, but it would be fun. Okay. I thought it would be a fun way to sort of try and tailor my story or tailor my, my responses to. Yeah. Okay, so let me actually needs. Yeah. do that. So the only thing is just that you need to have predetermined answers. So I think yours oh, is a okay, bit no, more free Don't form. worry, I'll ask, I'll ask them. I'll just ask Stop. you guys if you would mind typing in chat then. Because mm. I don't really have predetermined answers. So the Stop. first one I was going to do, and you can see embarrassingly that I was rapidly producing this today, is which sectors do you work for? Um, and then where do you think, what levels of um, readiness do you think people are at in your business or if you're an HR, I mean, if you're a freelancer, then, you know, how, so I was trying to address it from the set, from a perspective of, you know, what are your needs? What do you need to know out of this? Um, and I'll, out of this talk, out of my perspectives are based on, I'm a librarian, so I've kind of curated rather than created new material. For the, for the PowerPoint and for the discussion. Um, and I most recently was practicing implementation of web accessibility across a large educational institution, um, online educational provider with a connection to a global educational provider with whom they were still merging and trying to work out what, who was doing what at what level. And so it was fascinating to try and navigate that. Okay, that's useful to know. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, and in terms of what do you think the people in your business are aware of in terms of the value of accessibility or um, just their knowledge of what it actually what what it means and what it takes to you know what does the word accessibility in website design mean or just the concept of it? 
do you think people are sort of very ready or not? On a scale of one to 10, maybe one to five, one being not ready at all, five being very ready. Okay, so varied as usual. Yes, Lars, the red appetite for readiness is kind of where I'm going, what I was going for, yeah. Um, okay, useful. So quite a mix, three to five across different sectors. Um, I, yeah, I've, I've done, I'm a librarian by background, but I've done a lot of change management processes across governments for, in different roles. And most recently in the accessibility role, as someone myself with a disability, which is invisible, um, it's been fascinating to try to understand how to get across to people what this means. And as um, Shulk, Shulk said earlier, you know, it benefits all of us. 70% of people in a study from, I think it was the Royal National Institute for the Blind, who don't need captions will use it anyway. I'm finding as I'm getting older, I'm using captions and um, in a, a new piece of work I'm doing, somebody said, oh, why did you make the font 14 point? And I'm like trying to introduce that awareness about accessibility at that in that relationship. So it's more of a, well, actually I need it. I find it easy to blow things up to a bigger size, but also a 14 point font is on the low end of advisable accessibility. So it makes it easy for a lot more people to read. So I kind of thought I'd take a bit of a game, well, not quite gamified, but a humorous approach to this. And I kind of, I decided on the idea of a, um, a recipe for inspiring web accessibility in organizations. So first of all, you need a super sleuth, super hero, you need a game plan and you need some systems. And the link to the bingo bakery is quite a funny little, um, video. Um, I won't try and play it now because I think we are on a tight scale of time now. Um, but it's basically a, a web, it's a video of a website where they actually use the website's inaccessibility to educate people about landmarks and using tags appropriately. In, and the storyline is a woman who needs to buy a cake urgently for her son's birthday and how she dies every time because the website isn't actually, it's a very basic principle of games, um, isn't accessible so she can't find what she needs. Um, and I, 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 it's my go-to because it's quite funny and it's very old style. Um, so the super sleuth is probably you in the beginning, unless you know that there's somebody who's been appointed as a accessibility champion. Um, this was me last over the last two years um, but people like Jenison and um, Justin and yourself Shulk are obviously superheroes in the field one person I thought of as being quite a good superhero was um, well I've, I've Kat Holmes used to lead Microsoft design she now leads mismatch design her own company and she wrote a really interesting book on design called mismatch and it's about the fundamentals of accessibility and how to build it in. Um, Nancy, Nancy Drew figure on the left is just because I'm a librarian and I love the linen text bind and the old style design, but you do really need to find out more in your organizations about the processes and where they are. So if you're in an, if you're in a education environment, for example, it isn't just the web, <laughs> or it isn't just the site on which you offer the educational materials, it's also the marketing site and anything they put out, like, put out on another social platform. It's also the process by which students enroll. It's the, um, pro the support they get once they've enrolled. Um, is Do you have accessible PDFs? Do you have alt tagging on all your images? Are you even using alt tagging on your graphs? Are you using, um, are you going back to old fashioned styles of graph design and actually including the figure, the numbers of percentages of on each bar or each slice of the pie chart? Are you using different colors? Are they color contrast effective? Um, you can't do all of that all the time, but um, I'm going to, I saw your point and I'm gonna 
what you do, what you asked. So this is the bingo bakery. Um, oh, hang on, I've done it twice. There you go. That's the bingo bakery video. Um, and essentially, you need to sort of sniff out the processes like Nancy Drew would sniff out the clues and sniff out who's doing what and where you could improve and build a, a sort of network of superheroes across the department, across the business. In fintech, I know I had a colleague, I, I met somebody on LinkedIn approached me earlier this year, um, and he, he was involved in a business which builds fintech, much like you do, Justin, your business does some of that, but they do it a lot for, one of their big clients was Canada Bank, and they kept having problems because they had an internal, um, well, they had a client, their client did have an accessibility group who were auditing this, the, the, whatever they were developing. And there was a lot of feedback loops repeating themselves around why it wasn't accessible and didn't meet the Canadian regulations. So if you're working in FinTech, I don't know, Justin might endorse this, but I would suggest it's just a, it's a just go and do it. Just sign up for or, or train yourself in the field. Um, there's IAAP credentials. I've borrowed a lot of stuff here from DQ, DEEQ, um, and they they offer a sort of self-managed course that's very much just PowerPoint slide deck click throughs and questions, but they also have a full package of materials and interactive training which they offer. And I, I'm not aware of South, local South African companies which do that. Yeah, DQ is the major, they're significantly behind that. The other, one of the other big North players in the North in America is, they've just gone, they used to be the Pacello group and they've just gone to an acronym TPG. Um, But yeah, I, I have to say when I looked locally, I wasn't aware of anyone on that scale or even smaller, although there are independent people who do do um, work. And if you want to include people who are actually experiencing certain specific kinds of disabilities, there, there is a big um, upswell in various represent groups representing different kinds of disabilities and people and I've often thought there's a, a niche in the market for a for a group locally that that is able to do that and coordinate it and sort of sell the services but that's another thing to think about um what I found useful when I was starting my tr uh, was trying to implement a network at this education provider was to try and find key people. Initially, they weren't collecting questions and they said there'd be no questions. And then it transpired that within six months of me joining, they had five questions that had come through from people with on an Asperger's autistic spectrum or ASD spectrum or neurodiverse spectrum to people who were blind and had been told that they had the courses were not accessible, which was not true. Um, Luckily, they were redirected to an appropriate person, not me, and they did sign up and they did complete a course. And they happened to work for a large fintech business um, and had already been running for themselves large groups of global research teams using various software. So it's kind of a looking at what you already do, what's the baseline, um, and then how could you do that better? What are the quick wins? So for me, some of the quick wins were improving PDFs, um, standardizing alt tags on, or, or creating awareness about the value and necessity of alt tags, especially in the educational side of the, the educational platform and materials. And then interestingly enough, that's also about taxonomy. That's also about how long are your alt tags gonna be? What kind of disciplinary subjects are you actually dealing with? Um, some of the words in, in various disciplines are quite complicated. Um, how much tech space does that take up, you know, and how much cognitive space does a very long alt text 
take up. Do you want to go for full on descriptive text, which is a trend, um, which is more like in a video where you've got a person standing, you wouldn't just say, you'd actually have a narrator come in and, and dictate and narrate that explanation of what is on the screen at every moment, including, and this is important regardless of whether you describe the person, but if, if you use a graph and you're filming a graph or you're filming an image on screen or an infographic, you need to describe that because people will not, people who are visually impaired or use screen readers or have other cognitive issues may not be able to or won't be able to see that and interpret it effectively. And they will lose out on material on valued information and content. And that applies in simpler forms across most websites. Um, other quick wins were, as Skalk said, and I think there's a DQ presentation where this, the presenter mentioned this, but um, I got it into their procurement processes, into the legal, I, I, I found relevant people to speak to in the legal department and I managed to develop a good relationship, which enabled us to get some procurement, some questions around accessibility onto the procurement checklists. Um, yeah. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks for filling in the gaps. That's very useful. Um, and so what we asked were, because we were dealing with a large number of institutions overseas, we, we asked questions like, um, what is your, I mean, the simplest one is, do you have an accessibility statement which defines what your, what you're offering someone um, and what they, and helps them to find out what rights they would have to request certain kinds of information from you in a different format or extra support during the webinar or and then um, a roadmap of what their plans for developing those things were. So the two ideas were um, policy, accessibility policy or statement and a roadmap of for development planning. So the dev team, and it was interesting how many people, um, well, I, I knew that the teams I was working with were not very familiar, but how many people that of the applications we were looking at incorporating into various parts of both the marketing site and the website, the educational platform, the development teams of those apps didn't always, were very unforthcoming. <laughs> In, in general, or very reticent to share um, their, their plans or commit to any kind of level of agreement. In the States, if you're dealing with businesses in the, in the United States, you'll often hear terms like 508, ADA, um, and VPAT. And basically the American Disabilities Act allows for a number of significant rights which are encapsulated in the subtitle so two and three of that act. And there's specifically a section called the 508, which applies to all government websites and all providers of services to the public that specifically where they connect with government websites as well. Um, Yeah, so if you I mean, if you're looking to quickly evaluate where you are as a company, there's um, a couple of useful ways of doing that. And Dick in this survey has set up a survey for a workshop that I attended, and they've I did they worked with Forrester and identified three kind of states of play, if you like. So one would be if you're initiating. Like, no, it's very under that your business isn't well known. It doesn't know accessibility well, sorry. It doesn't know accessibility much. And it's not documented and people are doing things in a very sporadic way and it's not consistent. You'd probably be at the stage of initiating things. Um, you move gradually past that towards establishing more credibility and more consistency of practice and more standardized processes across 
the business. And it can take years. It does often take years. And then you might be scaling that by training, by having little pockets of training that can be delivered or by the accessibility team sending you know, um, content to, and to new joiners that's pertinent to their role. Um, and I include the link, I'll include the link here in the chat as well for the survey that DQ offers. Now, obviously they, they want some information from you, but it might be a valuable way of getting a baseline on where you're at or where you think your business is at. Um, and then they very usefully also offered the following, which I will cut and paste into the chat again, um, links to action plans for each stage. So once you know where you're at or what you, you know, what you are, what your business is currently up to, I'll, I'll have to, um, hang on. Okay, maybe you can share a, a link to the slides. Uh, I see it's it's Google Slides. Yeah, uh, I will share a link to the slides. That'll cool. be easier, I think. Mm. But here's those links, but there might be a bit of a mess. Um, so they've got one for each stage. And one of the ideas behind what I try to do was to give, speak to people up and down the scale of authority from people who were doing text editing who just wanted to know, you know, what's the alt tag? How do we do an effective, create an effective alt tag in this particular scenario for this particular piece of content, right through to the CEO and trying to get him to champion or to be aware of the value of the ROI. And Deloitte has done a very useful study um, because one in five of us will have a disability during our lifetime. And as you can see from the slide, well, as some of you may be able to see from the side, up to 1 billion people worldwide experience disabilities or live with them. We also have up to 700 million people aging. And then 2.4 billion people who are affiliated with those people who have a disability will not use a website that um, out of either loyalty or because they just don't need to, that isn't accessible. So if they're, and then there's the, um, curb cut effect, which is the idea that things that have been designed for specific needs, like potholders that people designed for arthritis, for the woman, a man designed potholders for his wife who had arthritis, and lots of people now use those potholders because they're useful, they're useful regardless whether you have arthritis or not. Similarly, the curb, the idea that the curb is made accessible, um, curbs on the side of roads are made accessible for people with wheelchairs, People with strollers use that. People with, uh, if you if you use an assisted aid to help you walk, you might use that. We all sometimes might decide we want to just use the curb cut, the, the lower level to get to the road. It just makes it easier. Um, the other thing that you probably may have noticed if you've ever caught a train, um, in this country, it's, it's fairly consistent in Cape Town, even though the trains aren't running. Um, well, is the yellow blocks with bubbles, the yellow concrete blocks with bubbles, which on, on roadsides and on, some roadsides and on stations, which are for people with visual impairment and color blindness and people who use guide dogs. And it's kind of a trigger to say, stop here. This is where you will be safe. And dogs, I think, are trained to use that as a guideline. So then we get on to systems, um, which can help you. And WCAG, yes, it is clunky and technical, and there's a lot of content to wade through, and you can easily get lost. Um, and they revise their sites and they revise pages. So you can find stuff that was from when they still were W when the guidelines were still at level one. And it's still valid, but it's not written in as snazzy a way as it could be. Um, so I've tried to pick up two, er, two systems that I thought would be useful, or two guidelines to systems. One is that the WCAG does have a project for mapping roles to, and responsibilities in a business to accessibility. 
So, you know, obviously a designer's role is going to be different and have different responsibilities, whereas a product manager's role will be slightly more sophisticated and product a project manager scheduling things might be a need to be aware of the time frames required to develop accessible material um, and then yes wcag's guidelines are really the old style format is really quite tiring and i'm going to try and see if i can just share this screen no not that screen i uh, mm, this screen, which is a librarian's delight because you can filter by, so it can, it, it's got the four principles of accessibility and all the breakdowns and all the very technical language and, and detail, but you can go in here and you can say, okay, well, I'm a visual designer. I'm only looking at visual content. So I only want to look at stuff that impacts visual design. It's not, you can also choose to select the option um, that you want. I mean, most people I was aware of were still on 2.0. I know 2.2 is already out, but this hasn't been incorporated. And version three is coming soon, I believe. And so you can go in here and select just what levels you want. Um, the minimum level is level A, which is sort of the very, very basics of making text accessible, including accessible text, color contrast, navigability, so that you can click around the site using tab um, or the four arrow keys and maybe using enter or the shift button, the main control shift button at the bottom of, the, of a keyboard, um, which to for people to take actions and then you can look you can choose do you want to just know like what are the sufficient techniques how much do you actually have to do what would be advisory what would make your site a bit more snazzy and actually easier to use and you can select from which types of technologies you're using now i'm not a code expert i did i did do some early coding but it's not been my focus has been mine has been using testing tools to test websites and then try and then making recommendations on what we could do to improve the app or its integration in the platform or the navigation as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that it this is a slightly it, it makes it slightly more palatable. It's, it's slightly easier to choose the one thing you want to really dig into or the five things you really need to know, and then only look at the components of information that you'd need for that. Um, I'm sure this, well, these are my last two slides are really about other systems. So this is, um, I think, an image also from Deke's site, which I haven't cropped properly, sorry. But it's um, an image of Microsoft's versions that they took Deke's Axe tools and they've, uh, they've adapted them to their system. Um, and then finally, just a little note about, it's really like a wave. You don't want to go for the Hokushai wave. I did, and it doesn't work. You need to be aware that when you're doing this, it's really like looking for the small waves and small benefits and building that up towards a slightly larger wave that you can maybe surf, surf the tide of enthusiasm for, for this for integrating accessibility across the different platforms and in the different processes and for the different stakeholders that you have. And eventually you will get to the Hakusai wave, but you don't want to wash everything away um, in one fell swoop. And you probably will find that you can't really do that. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's me, that's my presentation. Um, my experiences were really about that. Um, and very, there were lots of stress points. It was quite frustrating being slightly on the spectrum myself and being a bit ADD. I used to drop things, forget things, get over enthusiastic about things. <laughs> and even with the best of intentions and checklists and checklists on checklists and learning to use Asana while we moved to Jira. <laughs> 
and only this part of Jira and not that part, while another team is using this part. So it, it can get quite um, frustrating at times. And I think it's, it's always wise to take a breath, step back, and yes, count your, you know, do look at what you've achieved. Do look at the quick wins you've achieved. Um, that one person in, in, that, in the content development team who's writing better alt tags because they understand how to translate mathematical terms into a way that, or they're not duplicating alt tags and captions because it's already been described in the paragraph of text on the screen above. Small things are the, the best way forward, I think. I'm happy to take comments or let Justin jump in. And I'm always available if people would like to check in. Yeah, we can, definitely, we can definitely do a big Q and A session uh, at the end. I, I think we can release the Justin. <laughs> but but thanks so much, Kate. Like that, that was super insightful. Like I, I think I, I didn't know about those roles breakdown um, that you shared. That to me was super insightful. Insightful, yeah. like. Because that's always been the thing that I've been struggling with is, you know, like, how do you break this down? Um, because even uh, the A11Y project, like, is very developer focused um, mm. to kind of tease out the, the, like, visual design things there. Um, yeah. I was lucky I got to move. Well, it was lucky, but it was also quite traumatizing for a new person. But I, I moved from one team that was focused on the educational stuff and they urgently needed somebody to support on accessibility mm. for marketing site, for the marketing side. So I was actually able to generate enough enthusiasm that <laughs> people who'd been keeping quiet but were silent partners became more active and, I, and actually somebody took it on as their role within that team mm. and integrated it. In. So you really can sow the seeds and you do need a network you can't there's no way as you would know that you can do all of it <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Sure. on your own you know you can't yeah. you can't be there telling everybody color contrast check and being told please check every color contrast because there's just no way you can get through all of that mm. yeah. yeah no for sure and i uh you know you you mentioned you know kind of like how you also benefit from like accessibility and so forth and you know i, I think we we kind of over we underestimate kind of like the the value of these type of like so myself like it's it's always hard i don't know whether i would classify it as a as a disability but you know like i i'm pretty open about my kind of my history with like mental illness and so forth and, and you know so i definitely kind of also have like this this wellspring that i can draw on in terms of just like feeling excluded and feeling like you know i can't like just like like trying to slot into the world and you know I'm trying to kind of find my place and so so um yeah like I think for me personally that's what I draw on and I I think all of us kind of have something that we can draw on to kind of relate that feeling of like kind of feeling excluded and and and, and so forth and I think that's a great like driving force in terms of like wanting to kind of make things better in this regard yeah. I think one thing I wanted to do that I didn't get to do because my line manager at the time was, he didn't, I don't think we spoke the same language in certain ways, but um, I have a drama background and I wanted to, in our main meeting, we had a weekly meeting that was just a group get together so the different parts of that mm. team could collaborate. Um, and I wanted to shut the, all the lights off and get them to come in <laughs> and find a seat because it would be such a good example of yeah. what it feels like to be navigating a website that you have no way of understanding where you are. Mm. Anyway. Mm. Cool. Justin, you ready to go? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, cool. Share my screen. Can I share my entire, yes, I can, okay. Yes. Um, Right. Can you see my slides? Yes. Cool. Okay. So I'm, I work at a company called NML. I'm head of design and front end. Um, and we build software applications, web applications, not websites per se. Um, so um, accessibility is an important uh, thing, um, aspect of what we do. Um, and we approach it as just something that we do as a matter of course, rather than 
an extra or an add-on or a line item in a budget or anything like that. Um, and it starts with our design practice all the way through to our completed front-end product. Um, so I'll just run through some a couple of slides and then I'll jump into to showing you some examples of how we do this. Um, yeah, now I know Skulk has already mentioned the W3C mission. <laughs> I'm kind of repeating myself, but you know, the two fundamental design principles are, you know, the web for all, that everyone should be able to access the web and use it, and that the web should be available on everything. So all devices, um, no matter what they may be. And that also means not just necessarily a screen that you look at. Um, yeah, so the WCC design principles are part of their mission and they've been around for a long, long time, um, since the beginning of the web. And um, and as Scott mentioned, something that really has its, its origins with um, the work of, of Tim Berners-Lee right at the beginning of um, the creation of the, of the web. Right, so um, like, you know, most design teams, we once we've figured out all our user flows and done our UX research and so on, we then start to design UIs. Um, and it doesn't really matter what tool you use. Well, we use Sketch just because I guess I'm old and I like it. Um, <laughs> um, and, and you own a Mac. <laughs> and I own a couple of Macs. <laughs> Um, yeah, we all work on Macs, so Sketch makes sense for us. Um, we use Zeppelin for handoff to developers if required, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so um, accessibility starts in our initial design phase. So we have, we're bearing it in mind right from the beginning. It's not something we fix later. Um, of course, there's only so much you can do within a UI design tool regarding accessibility. Um, you're quite limited to that. You know, you're really looking at things like text sizes, font, uh, font choices, uh, color contrast, uh, justification of text, uh, things like that, that you can um, test and make sure that you that they're working well. But that's only part of it. Um, but this does save a lot of time later when you, you're not suddenly seeing in the browser uh, that contrast is really, really not working or you've got some issues with text sizing and so on. Um, to that end, we use an assistant, um, the Sketch uh, Accessibility Assistant, and I'll show you how that works. And then we also use a plugin called Clues, um, and Clues is a contrast checker. Um, ben, um, for me, what you, one of the you know the fundamental building block of accessibility on the web is HTML, and I think um, to some extent we've lost um, the power of HTML. Um, through various ways in which we write front ends these days. Uh, not that I am anti JavaScript frameworks at all. That is far from, 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 from the case. Um, but HTML gives us a huge amount out of the box. Um, and uh, we should be, if we're serious about HTML, we should be very, very cognizant of the kinds of HTML tags we're using and to use them in the appropriate places. Um, so, Accessibility trees are built into various HTML tags, and they give us they and they are accessible by default. There's nothing extra we need to do to them to make them accessible. And these are things like landmarks, um, nav, aside, header, article, section, details, um, dialogue, uh, you know, all these all these HTML tags that have landmark roles um, already in the browser and exposed by the browser in the accessibility tree. Um, and um, to help us with this, we use a couple of VS Code extensions, and I'll, I'll show you how these work as well. Uh, one is the Ax, um, Accessibility Linter, which is a VS Code extension. It, as you type, it tells you um, if you're making accessibility errors. And then something else called Error Lens, which people may be familiar with. It's incredibly verbose, Error Lens. It's really irritating, actually. <laughs> because um, as you typing, it will just give you thousands of warnings. So you, so we, we tend to switch off the warnings and hints and then turn them all on when we finish the component um, and see if anything pops up. Um, otherwise, uh, you spend more, more time dismissing the error lens warning than, than doing the actual work. Um, yeah, it gets just a little bit irritating because if you're in, in CSS, for example, and you write a class, 
and then you open and close your brackets, it automatically tells you you can't have an empty rule set. Um, and you know, you, you kind of, well, I know that I haven't written it yet, you know, <laughs> so, um, uh, but I will show you how that works. Um, it, it saves a lot of time as well. And then of course, ARIA, um, accessible rich internet applications, roles and attributes. And this is a crucial two words there are where applicable. Scott mentioned that um, some accessibility audits have actually shown that ARIA can be more of a hindrance than a help. And that's often because we're using ARIA where we don't need to. Yeah. And it's important to know that, to make sure that we, we're not using ARIA roles that are redundant. For example, if I have a button, I don't need to say button role equals button. That is a redundant ARIA role and that confuses screen readers. The button has role of button built into it as part of its own accessibility tree. So we don't need to worry about um, roles on certain things. All of the landmarks don't need roles. So nav, we don't need nav role equals navigation, header role equals banner, and so on and so on. We don't need any of, to add any of those roles to those um, uh, navigation, but to those uh, landmark uh, elements because the browser already um, adds them. So just to reiterate that point, most HTML, HTML elements have default semantics that are exposed by browsers. Yeah. So there are very, very few HTML elements where we actually need to think about roles or area attributes. They are already built into the accessibility tree. When I say browsers, I of course mean modern browsers. Um, if we are still supporting old browsers, then we need to approach things slightly, slightly differently. Right, and then, you know, another thing is CSS, and I think CSS is often um, neglected when we're talking about accessibility in favor of HTML and peppering everything with ARIA roles and attributes and, you know, ARIA label by and ARIA hidden true and, and so on, which often aren't necessary. Um, and then we do some things in our CSS that kind of undo uh, the, uh, the good work that we might be doing in our HTML. One thing I see people doing all the time is removing focus states on buttons and inputs. Like the default, particularly in Chrome and the WebKit based browsers is that big light blue box shadow, which looks terrible and often obscures um, your UI. So people go and take it away, uh, focus outline none, but then don't replace it with anything. So now you've got no fake focus states um, added to your, to your input element. So if, it's fine to remove the default, but then you must replace it with, um, with a sensible fallback so that uh, focus uh, states are still visible. So there are a couple of things we can do like using modern CSS, um, focus visibility I've just mentioned, really, really important that we um, actually are designing focus states in our design steps, um, respecting our source order. So one thing that Flexbox and Grid allow us to do is change source order as much as we like, um, just by the order property. So I can have something that's you know, tenth in my HTML structure and say order one on a display flex container. And that's gonna move it in the visual layout, but it's not moving it in the actual HTML or the markup. And that can cause problems again with screen readers. So we need to be careful about respecting source order, despite the, the nice tools that Flexbox and Grid give us around these elements, they can often cause accessibility problems. And then zoom and reflow. Um, yeah, so again, this is like respecting user preferences. Um, are we using units of measure, for example, that uh, allow zooming and reflow? This has become less of an issue. Um, it used to be a big issue with older versions of IE that couldn't zoom properly. Um, but we still need to be cognizant of this. How does our page, and this particularly uh, applies to uh, cross devices, you know, how does our page reflow when screen size and orientations change? Um, are, are, are elements still accessible? And then we should also be respecting user preferences such as reduced motion as an example. So, you know, user uh, at media prefers reduced motion is somewhat, you know, for people, animation can be um, a, an unpleasant experience for many people, um, particularly if it's overdone. So, and they might have their user preference on their device set to, uh, you know, reduce motion, but now we are sending them this incredibly complex and crazy CSS or JavaScript animation that's uh, causing problems um, of, and, a, you know, it could be problems uh, of any kind. 
So we always need to, when we're doing animation, as an example, respect user preferences via um, something like uh, reduced motion. And then of course, color and contrast. I mean, this is a really, really important one. Are we, are we checking our colors and contrast? Are we checking for color blindness? Are we looking at um, various types of color blindness? Um, I have slight red green um, color blindness and uh, uh, certain reds on a green background, I cannot see the red at all. It just disappears. Um, so, you know, checking for color blindness and the all different types of color blindnesses as well um, are really important. And then um, in the browser, we can also test in the browser with various accessibility tools that are baked in. And I'll show you um, some examples of using these as well. Um, so we've got built-in accessibility tools in all the major browsers, Chrome, Safari, Edge, um, Firefox, and we can use those. And um, sorry, that's an old thing. Whoops, <laughs> old slide deck repurposed. <laughs> okay. Um, let me move to some demos. Can you all see now the sketch document? Yeah, okay. So this is something that we're actually working on. Um, my team is working on at the moment. It's just the banner. Um, and I went in and made it bad <laughs> to show you um, how, how in Sketch uh, we deal with uh, contrast issues. So there are two things in Sketch we use I've mentioned. Um, the one is um, the assistant. So I'm just going to show the assistant, and here we have um, our in a what I find a great irony, an accessibility assistant with type so small that you can't read it. <laughs> um, so yeah, but anyway, this is a, a sketches uh, accessibility. Uh, it checks for color contrast compliances. Uh, around shapes and text, it checks for dust justification. So we can see here our justification is fine. But if I go and open this app, it's gonna tell me um, in some cases that I've got some issues. Um, so there we go. Layers pass two and login do not pass WCAG 2.1 AA and the contrast ratio is 2.7.2.1. So that's already telling me, okay, there's an issue here. And um, it tells me exactly uh, where that applying and I can click that and it shows me in my layer uh, where I've got the issue. Okay, so, so that's just a generalized thing that you can check your entire document. You know, in Sketch we would often have maybe 20 or so artboards in a file. Um, it'll check the whole thing for you. Another tool that we use is, um, as I said, it's called uh, uh, Clues and it's a plugin. So here I can go and select my text here and I'll select my background and then I'll just open clues and it'll tell me, okay, cool, you're, you're doing fine here. You're both triple A and double A compliant um, with these elements. And we can say, okay, that's great, fantastic. Um, but then I can select another one down here. And this is the one where I, that I broke. And you can see here, we've got um, AA compliance, but we do not have triple A compliance. And if I go in even further and I drill down into just the text, um, we can see, oh dear, you know, we're failing everywhere here. Okay, this is just no good. Um, so what I can now do is um, on my foreground color, obviously that's the issue. My background color is always going to be white. I can just drag the slider and you can see it's starting to change my color values and my contrast ratios. And eventually I'll hit AA, great. And if I carry on, I'm going to hit triple A. Awesome, fantastic. And it's actually updated my color automatically. On the right here, there's my uh, full color for this um, particular element. And I can hit OK, and it will now save that for me. So we do that in Sketch to start with. Um, we do color contrast checking. We check text length, all, all that kind of thing. And then once that's happy, we can then go um, and get into um, building our um, our application. Okay, so I'm just going to switch over to um, VS Code and uh, sh show you here um, just a little bit on how we might write um, some HTML and um, how our linters and accessibility things um, help us out. 
So the Axe Accessibility link, uh, Linter is the most important thing that we use here. Um, and if I just go to an index.html and I go and I type button, and that's all I do, right? You'll see it's automatically now telling me there's an error here. And if I hover over it, it's gonna tell me what the problem is. Ensure buttons have a discernible text. Okay, so I've got no text in my button. That's an error. Um, and I can view the problem and it'll open it up and it'll tell me the Axelinter has found that your button doesn't have any text. And you can actually, the, the, this linter is created by DEC University who are an accessibility uh, 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 consultancy. And you can actually click on this link um, and it'll go right there and it'll tell me why this is giving me a problem. So what should buttons look like always? So this comes straight from my code base if I'm not sure. So I can go and add text here um, and you'll see, okay, that one is now fine, but I have two problems. What's my second problem? Um, I'm just gonna close that. And you'll see here, button type attribute has not been set. Okay, and if I click on that, I need to now go and say, okay, this is type equals button. And now my, my issues have been resolved. As you can see, there's no underlines anymore. It's all good. Now I know that that is now an accessible um, HTML component. Uh, everything is correct. If I go and I try and add an input, whoops, I'm just gonna add an input um, of um, type equals um, text. Okay, immediately now I've got another error. And what is this error going to be? Well, this error is now going to be uh, your form element must always have a label. Okay. Now, that's a major issue that you see in accessibility, form elements without labels. I mean, if, you've, if you're writing an input, you must have a label. <laughs> okay. Um, so I can then go, there are two ways to do this. I can wrap this in a label. Um, so I can just go and wrap that inside a label. Um, whoops. Sorry, and I still have an issue because my label needs to have a four attribute and my input needs to have an ID that matches that. Okay, otherwise I'm still having issues. And now it has no title or placeholder attribute. So it really tells you all the things that you need to make an accessible um, component. Now, if I, for example, go and add some new fangled thing like um, details, as you can see, um, it's not even in my autocomplete yet. We start, oh, it is. We start to get some, some issues here. So details is gonna say, details is not supported by Internet Explorer. <laughs> okay, so it's also telling you um, if you do have to support for certain things, that this isn't this just isn't going to work for your use case. Yeah. So you're automatically creating um, these um, uh, HTML uh, elements that are compatible across a whole range of things um, within your uh, within your within your code base, yeah. and that saves a whole lot of problems down the line because you know, okay, I've created something good. All right. Um, so you know, never do something like this which we see a lot, span roll equals button, rile equals, geez, whenever you type, it doesn't work, okay? Should go and buy a PC. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is just inaccessible. So a button, if I do this, and I, I see this a lot in the wild, I'm taking a span and then I'm assigning it an area role of button. And, and I think I'm being accessible, but ac actually I'm not, because now I need to go and make that clickable and add all the elements we get for free from a button in JavaScript. So always use appropriate HTML elements um, where they are appropriate. 
Okay, so um, the the kind of next thing we do is uh, testing in the in the browser. So once we have our front end built, and we generally are we building things in React, we're usually using Next.js, um, and we use Storybook as well, and we have um, um, accessibility uh, plugins for our Storybook. So we're running tests there as well. Um, that check accessibility in our storybook. So the, by the time our applications get into the browser and are ready for QA, they should have gone through rigorous um, accessibility testing. And as I say, it's not something we do extra, it's just part of the flow of how we work. All right, So, but then we do do tests in the browser using browser tools, and I'm going to fall on my own sword now and do an accessibility test on my own website, which I know has accessibility issues. <laughs> which I haven't fixed yet, but I, I do know about them. Okay, so in Firefox, what you can do is um, you can click anywhere, right click anywhere, and it brings up a, a, a context menu, and then you can go and access, ac uh, inspect accessibility properties. So I'm just gonna do it on this text node here. I'll go inspect accessibility properties, and you'll see it break, it's not showing me the, the, the document tree. Um, that the accessibility API exposes. So this is a text container. Um, you'll see there um, it's role, text, container. Now I haven't assigned that role anywhere in my HTML. That's the browser assigning the role of text and container. So again, like as I said, most HTML elements already have these roles assigned to them. If I um, open that up again, it now goes to the actual text leaf and you can see here, yeah, my color and contrast is good, triple A. Good job, nice one, well done. Um, so that's all good. Um, you'll see if you, if you go to your inspector and, and you just click on, I'll, I'll click on my HTML root, and if I right click on that, I also get access to the accessibility property straight from the inspector. So I can click on that, and that's gonna show my document. And you can see there's the name, there's the role of document. Again, that's not a role that I've set, a role that the browser's setting. And you can see it's showing that we've got two landmarks here. So the landmark at the top is um, a role of landmark and it's uh, a DOM node of header, main header. And if I click on this little uh, icon here, it's gonna open it up. Let me make this a bit bigger. I should have done that already. It's gonna go open that up in my inspector you know, where I can then go and inspect my flex properties or whatever they might be. Now I know there's an issue on my links. So I'm gonna inspect the accessibility property of my link. And remember what I said earlier about not removing focus? Guess who removed focus um, on his links? That would be me. <laughs> um, so it's telling me that I'm missing a focus styleable style, uh, Focusable element is missing um, a focus styling, and that is a link, yeah. So I need to go and fix that, yeah. So if, if I had to come through this and go and tab through on my keyboard, I'm not gonna get a visual representation of where I am, because I only have a hover and a visited state and not a focus state. Bad, bad, bad stuff. However, uh, color, contrast, triple A, all work, that's all good, but there's an issue on, on the link. Okay, um, then I'm just gonna quickly go to another page and I mean, um, just inspect this accessibility property. And this is something that I actually don't understand. So if anyone can help me, and that would be much appreciated. Um, but you see, I've got my figure here in my HTML. Um, I've got a figure, a very uh, valid HTML tag. And then within that, I've got an image with an alt tag right? All good. There should be nothing wrong with that. But when I go to my accessibility tree, it says figures with optional captions should be labeled. And I can't figure out what that means. So if anybody knows, please let me, please tell me <laughs> so I can fix it. Because I've got my figure, I've got my image, it's got an alt tag, it's all looking good as far as I can tell, unless there's something that's crazy that I'm missing. Okay. Um, so that's in Firefox. In Chrome, um, you can go to your inspector and um, you can go to an accessibility tab here. 
but this isn't nearly as good as the one in Firefox. Yeah, it's um, it doesn't give you nearly as much information as the Firefox one does. Rather, in Chrome, you want to go to Lighthouse, and when you come to Lighthouse, these are all ticked, and just untick all of them, and just keep the accessibility one ticked, and then you can run generate reports, and that will then run through this on a mobile. This I'm checking mobile uh, for accessibility and it'll just run and do that, checks everything, 97 out of 100. Background and foreground colors do not have sufficient contrast ratio. Now you see this wasn't um, picked up by Firefox. Okay, Firefox was like, that's fine. Chrome says, no, that's not fine. This is not actually your contrast here is not uh, good enough, and it's that over there. So you get different results often from different browsers. They implement these things slightly differently. And then often contrast uh, is a tricky one because you often get mis, like misreadings on the browser tools. So you just need to be careful with that. Um, but everything else is passed. Um, and you know my ARIA attributes, buttes match their roles. Um, I've got valid values. They're not misspelled. I've got a heading. Uh, skip link, I've got landmark regions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in Safari, uh, so our Edge, new Edge is exactly the same as Chrome, works exactly the same way. In Safari, we can also inspect elements and then we can go to audit. Um, and then you'll see there are two things we can do here. When you open this up, it looks like this. Um, and if you go to specially exposed data, you can open that up and then you can click on accessibility and then just click run and you'll see that run. Safari says there are no issues. Um, but there are two accessibility checks on Safari. There's exposed data and then um, there's another accessibility check down here which checks for roles and area and all those kinds of things separately. Okay, so you can also run that. Um, which is not working, there we go, oh, 100%. Uh, so you see, <laughs> Firefox says, yeah, you've got a couple of issues with, um, with focus styles. Chrome says, it's all good, but there's some contrast issues. And then Safari says, no, it's all fine. Yeah. So again, we need to be very careful with these tools. Don't just test in one, right? And don't just go, yeah. developers tend to be very Chrome-centric. That's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, don't always just go and check your accessibility stuff in one browser. That's not going to be, um, that's not going to be acceptable because you're going to get different results. Okay. Uh, and then you can also, you know, do keyboard tests where, again, I, my site, I will fail um, because of the lack of focus styles, so uh, it's not even getting onto the page, which is my bad. Um, but as you tab through the, the site, you should be getting focus styles on all your links and you should be checking all of that. Okay. Then one other thing that you can also use for testing is a screen reader. If you're on an iOS device, you can, um, uh, that, that is built in. You can go to accessibility and turn, turn on voice control um, and that will uh, let you um, do do screen reader tests on an iOS device. So you can do that on um, iPhones and iPads, and you can also do it on a Mac, um, also by going to system preferences, um, accessibility, um, and uh, turning on voiceover, as you can see there. Right. Um, for Windows, you can use a screen reader like JAWS or the other one, whose name I can never remember, in something. <laughs> uh, that one, uh, uh, Kate mentioned that mentioned them, or, or, or Skulk, I, I, one of the two. Um, so you can also do that kind of, of testing. And yeah, so that's our process. As I said, starts in the design phase where we're already testing for uh, contrast and color, then uh, and 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 text elements, then moving into um, our 
HTML structure where we're structuring everything with accessibility linters while we are developing. So not just JavaScript linters, also accessibility linters, um, which are very, very useful. Uh, and then once we get into our storybook uh, build, then we have a storybook add-on that's also automatically checking for access accessibility. And then once we get into the actual browser uh, with the front end, we are doing these uh, various uh, browser checks um, as we go along. If you are deploying anything via Netlify, and Skulk and I would say you should be deploying everything via Netlify, <laughs> um, and Netlify now has a set of plugins, one of which is the accessibility plugin. And you can install this with by one click. Yeah, you can add it to um, any of the sites that you are deploying from Netlify. And it'll run an accessibility check uh, using um, the, uh, sorry, I'll just go to the GitHub page. It uses the, uh, this automated um, testing library as accessibility testing library and uh, just installs it. When, once you run a build, it runs all these checks, accessibility checks. And if you, if you miss one, it won't complete your build. Yeah, it'll bump your build out and say, go and fix this before I let you deploy this. Yeah. So it's like a fail safe for accessibility in your deployment process. Um, where you run all the checks against your code base um, to make sure that um, you aren't uh, failing anywhere on uh, on accessibility. Yeah, I think that is it from me. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Justin. I really appreciate that. I, I also kind of learned quite a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, we don't have much time left but I maybe want to open the floor, see if there are any general questions. Um, I just quickly want to mention something. So um, you mentioned the blue hover style on um, Chrome. And I recently saw, I don't know whether it's just on my side, but they changed it to bl a black outline. And it also seems uh, to- yes. And it also seems to now only trigger on ta like actual tabbing. Uh, and no longer on clicks. Ah, okay. So there's a new CSS property. It's called focus within, mm -hmm. um, which I should have mentioned. Um, so focus within is designed to work with tabbing on input as opposed to click. So you can set a focus style and you can set mm -hmm. a focus within style. Um, mm -hmm. So you can differentiate between the style on a click and the style on a, on a, on a tap. Or a tab, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, but but it's usually so, like and the... Chrome, mm -hmm. Chrome and Edge recently redesigned all their form input controls, so yeah. it's probably part of that. Yeah, yeah, which is amazing because I I was I was talking to some students this week and um, I kind of told them about like you know oh you know if you want to get rid of the blue thing don't do this and whatever and they were like they don't see it when they click. Blue thing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, and, I don't... And I never realized, I but like it's gone now. If you click, oh, interesting. Mm, it no longer shows. Safari. It's definitely still in Safari. <laughs> yeah, it's probably um, going to get removed in like fifty years. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wasn't aware of it. I don't actually use Chrome, so mm. um, I wasn't aware of that. I don't know I, whether I always write my own focus style, except yeah, I, on my I, own website. I don't know whether anyone else is kind of seeing it on their side on Chrome as well, but it's definitely on my side. Yeah. I actually I installed Chrome for this demo, so I can check. Mm. So I, I just quickly need to give me two seconds. I just want to pop out, but um, maybe you guys can do some start with some Q and A quickly. Can I go ahead and just ask something? Sure. Um, I'd like to know. I'm busy. Designing a learning website, so it's WordPress with LearnDash and Astra, and um, I'm not certain that I'm going to make it accessible to blind users. Maybe to low. Uh, 
Sorry, we, uh, Tanya, we're losing you there. Partly because it's a project management course, which is going to end up having a lot of diagram. Uh, sorry, Tanya, we, we lost you there. Hello. Oh, she says she has an unstable connection. But I think as an aside, uh, I, I just quickly want to mention, I, I definitely want to um, bring uh, Tanya and some of her colleagues um, onto kind of like the FedSop podcast as well uh, to come chat about accessibility. I, I think she has a lot of insight. Uh, she has a lot of good stuff to share. Um, definitely. Mm. But maybe we uh, can... I, I didn't quite get the question. Was it around... Um, it, um, for people with, uh, who are visually impaired for Im images. Uh, I think right. so, because it's project management related. I see. Yeah, images. But I didn't tricky. catch all of it either. Yeah. Um, so screen readers will always read alt text. Um, but there's also an, an HTML. Um, is it CSS or screen reader only? Scott, is it an HTML tag or is it a or, or is it a CSS property? So I don't think I it's an, I don't think it's an official thing. I, I think it's a combination yeah. of like Z index and height and overflow and like uh, yeah, things. yeah, you're right. You're uh, right. Visually hidden, yeah. Yeah, there's there's like a there's like a you know, very much like the clear fix um yeah, class yeah. that everyone ended up using there's a like a very common utility class that everyone just uses but i don't think it's there's there's officially a way to i might be wrong i don't think there's a officially a way to do that apart from just applying those properties which yeah. kind of and moves, then you, i think it does like also like position absolute but like moves it like way off the screen and and, and stuff like that yeah yeah mm -hmm. so i, I I think the best way to deal with images for, for accessibility is to make use of the alt tag, but then also make sure that your markup is within the figure mm -hmm. um, as a container and that you're using the fig caption HTML tag. Um, and you can put as much information as you need within the fig caption tag. And it's meant, and the screen reader will know because it's inside the figure what, um, what visual material it's referring to. Um, but other than that, I find that's very image heavy. Um, and you just need to write a lot of descriptive text, I think, mm -hmm. which isn't easy. It's not easy to convey the same message. Yeah. I th and I think it's very hard, like also giving an answer without knowing more context, like, you know, maybe going that image heavy isn't necessarily the best course if that is, if accessibility is something that is important. Um, maybe you want to rely more on like tables and things. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I, I missed the initial part. So maybe she did give a ton of context. <laughs> I think she's actually, she's followed up in chat to say she was actually looking at cool code snippets for dyslexia styling. There's a couple of fonts that are dyslexia mm. friendly. Mm. But uh, yeah, they are. There's an open dyslexia. I, 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 I've, I've seen some people on Reddit um, of all places, actually mentioned that it's I'm changed gonna, their life. Let me attempt to talk again and see whether I've got a better connection. I'm, I know about open mm. dyslexia, um, mm. and I'm not all that comfortable with it. It actually does create a bit of a jarring effect for other people. So, you know, like you lose mm. some. Um, but I was more thinking in terms of styling, we, just for your general rules on body copy, I, I noticed the way that Justin's site there had the underlines spaced and they they look very comfortable i don't have a diagnosis of dyslexia and i'm probably not dyslexic but i cope very well with things designed for people with dyslexia i'm just somebody who reads quite slowly um and and i was wondering if especially if there's some stuff that you can kind of like copy paste hack oh i like that feature i like that thing but you know that's dyslexia specific if there might be mm -hmm. a resource for something like that then i can copy it into my back end of of css type styling I, I mean i'm aware of certain fonts in general things like calibri that have been designed 
as well for being dyslexia friendly. And I recently understood and learned that that was because of kerning, among other things, kerning and line mm -hmm. spacing, mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, which I hadn't really known before, but it makes sense to me now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, that, that whole suite of Microsoft fronts that was developed in the 90s was specifically designed for the screen. So a lot of attention was paid to, to making them readable mm. um, on screen and at small sizes as well. Um, I think for, 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 there are some guidelines online around styling text for, for, to make, for dyslexia to make things more readable. Um, I can't remember exactly. Um, I think of things like, you know, avoid italics, um, avoid uppercase, um, yeah. letter spacing a little bit, bump up your letter spacing a bit, um, and, your, and your word spacing, all those kinds, kinds of things to spread the text out a little bit more. Um, funnily enough, uh, underlining was, was a, was a no-no, I recall. Mm. Um, that is, the standard underline in CSS is very close to the descender of the yeah. font, yeah. whereas there are some properties that allow you to push it down. Um, so, you know, uh, if you do the, if you are underlining, then you know, keeping it further away, and then line spacing. I often find, like, for me as a non-dyslexic person, I find, and maybe because I'm you know a bit older, perhaps, but um, if I encounter text online that is that has a very uh, small line spacing it i can't read it and i actually go and change the css in the inspector <laughs> i go and bump up the line spacing because i can't i can't i find it very difficult to read oh, i imagine for someone cool. yeah i imagine someone who's dyslexic who, who, who's dyslexic um that kind of a, a line spacing must be a, a a nightmare when it's not big enough yeah so I'm, I'm, definitely I'm dealing with people who don't have standardized PowerPoint presentation and then they're literally the line, there's no line spacing and yeah, like yeah. that. And it's just, it actually makes me yeah. feel nauseous. Yeah, it's I can't very, very focus difficult. On, I'm so busy. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I get, I, ugh, yeah. It feels very visually cramping. I would think, I would think that generally, you know, like good, good typographic principles apply everywhere for every situation. You know? using lots of headings, distinguishing very clearly between sections, between headings, line spacing, good letter spacing. Kerning is now enabled by default in all browsers. So we don't mm. need to worry about having to go and uh, fix kerning. It's already right there. And that obviously um, adds to readability. Uh, yeah, your font choice. Um, you know, a serif font is much harder to read on the screen than a sans serif font. Um, so if you're going and, and you're going to even something that's made for the screen, like Georgia, is is still it's it's hard to it, it can be hard to read, especially at small sizes. Mm. Um, so definitely, uh, like geometric sans serif, modern sans serif font is really good. My um, my approach is like I, I tend to take the other approach. Like I, I think mine is very much more in line with kind of like Steve's approach, um, insofar that I don't necessarily go. So my assumption would be that, you know, if this is something that someone is struggling with, they probably have some type of Chrome extension or something that, you know, because always when I teach this and I talk about the open dyslexia font, like, uh, like students are always like, what do I need to use that now as my font? Because, you know, let, let's be honest, it looks horrible. Like it really looks like yeah. a Teletubby no, font. font. Um, it, it's not pretty, you know. Yeah, but so I think I've always just assumed someone will use some type of Chrome extension or something that just overrides the CSS. And so my job is just to provoke, like to prevent my design choices from breaking that and preventing that from happening. Uh, one being I shouldn't use BRs to do line breaks, you know, because when you do something like that, things just get crazy because now like words are at different places and things. Um, so I think that's my general take is I, I tend to approach it in the same way as I do with internationalization. Like I don't necessarily go out of my way to cater for it, but I make sure that if someone has some type of tool that 
that helps them deal with that issue that what I've built is easily consumable by that tool. Um, I, I disagree a little bit, to be mm. honest. Um, okay. I, I, I don't like to assume that the user is doing anything. <laughs> mm. um, and I think particularly when it comes to typography and Scott, you know, this is a drum I beat a lot. <laughs> No, 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 for sure. Uh, um, I think if you pay a lot of attention to your typography, everybody wins. You know, mm. It doesn't, and um, you shouldn't just go, oh, no, it's fine because people will hit mm. command plus or they'll zoom in or, or whatever, or they'll mm. go to inspect elements and change the line height like I do. Mm. Um, I mean, the web is primarily a, a reading medium. It doesn't matter what mm. you're doing. If you're filling in a form or whatever you're doing, you're, it's primarily a reading medium. Mm. Um, and there might for be them who can't change things because they haven't got the mobility to do so. That's or the they, true. Yeah. They've got limitations on the, t they're using a head, like a head attach pointer or something that just makes it clunkier mm. to, yeah. you, you know, mm. um, yeah. with a, or they're older and they don't find swiping easy or whatever. Mm. Mm. I guess maybe my my views on this is a bit colored, you know, as always, anecdotally, by just the people that I know that struggle from dyslexia um, and how they use the web. And, and to be honest, most of them kind of use some type of audio assistive thing. Um, where they just get the browser to not something as full on as JAWS, um, but you get like more like lightweight, like Chrome extensions, where you just highlight a, a, a paragraph of text and it just reads it for you. Um, so things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's also- Yeah, I mean, you can, you can do that in, um, just in the browser. Mm-mm-mm. Like uh, in um, in Safari, well, okay, you know, not everyone obviously has Safari, but you can just highlight a bit of text and then right click and select mm. start speaking and it speaks it to you. But of mm. course, not everyone can highlight a piece of text, right? Mm. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah. And I, so. I have to say, when I was working for this play, this educational provider, we actually had someone call in and say she's on the spectrum and she needs a tool that will help her focus. And then she called back and said, no, I found one. <laughs> she found an app and downloaded it and installed it on her phone and was rereading the material five times for herself using this app. And it's that funny thing of trying to trying to meet someone halfway when you're not absolutely sure what their mm. halfway is. Mm. I think the other thing well, is actually, as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, some years ago, I had extreme sensory problems and mm. I, I found I needed to reduce a lot of on-screen clutter, kind of like focus view in mm. um, WordPress, that kind of thing, or mm -hmm. full screen view. Uh, but And what I found was something where you, it chunks the text for you if you have to read a big body of stuff. And it was like a little window. And you select the big body of text, and then it pops it into the, kind of like a little reading window. I don't need that anymore because my sensory stuff has changed but that thing was exceptionally handy at the time and and screen overlays all of these things but they're things that you can actually install yourself i mean i've, I've just found that in general yeah. when websites are laid out for dyslexics they just actually work best for everybody um, yeah. and that's why it's, i would agree it with that like a, a good design pra practice mm. and that's that's why dyslexia is such a focus for me because then i know that i'm going to be accommodating if if i make that my my primary um, UX, this is what I imagine my user is. My user is dyslexic, and so therefore that's what I'm catering for. So earlier, when I had the unstable connection, my question about the blind one was actually that I, I'm even thinking that because in project management, you deal such a lot with things like network diagrams, Gantt charts, where you can't possibly really describe a large thing looks like that you have to pan through that I, I may actually decide that on some courses, I'm going to lose the blind, blind um, user. I don't, don't mind because mm. it's kind of like if you're going to have a painting class, you're not going to accommodate um, a blind person unless it's a very unusual type of painting, which has got a textural effect to it. So, mm. but, but the other disabilities I'd want to accommodate. 
So that's why my focus was particularly in, on, on dyslexia as being my central disability that I'm accommodating. And then the other things are also, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and that's um, another point. You said that, Justin, like selecting the audience, you might have to play one audience off against the other or accept certain prioritizations of what you can offer mm. or yeah, how definitely. you design for what you can offer. I mean, mm. I found that yeah. with what we were doing for educational stuff, you know, you want, you can't have everything always. Mm. <laughs> yes, sure, sure. I think this also and, speaks very, very to just general uh, progressive announcement principles. You know, absolutely. You, yeah. you, you get the same. Uh, so, like, I, I would say you have the exact same scenario, and um, when you're working with a lot of charts and things, and and you, it ideally should do mobile first. So then it isn't that much of a problem. But you know, that's not always how it works. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. you need to decide, okay, because things like tables and so forth, and you know, I'm, I'm saying this as someone that did a lot of work with National Treasury is, um, you know, like tables and like any type of thing where you need to cross reference material, like anything where you need to say this row and that column, the moment you lose that space of a screen, it starts, if you need to scroll around, like you lose that ability to immediately cross-reference things. And um, so it's exactly the same type of conversations, you know, like what, what mm. is the core journey here? And can we make sure that like whatever would be the core here, um, they are able to get and treat kind of all the other things as enhancements. Like maybe this is just, interesting ways to show the data uh, but maybe they yeah. can still get it in like a linear fashion in a table or as a bullet list or something yeah yeah Just and to, also um, do you really to, need to present so hmm. like it's it sort of retro engineers what you actually think of as good content hmm. um which yeah. is a challenge in itself and a whole nother process but yeah um, yeah and yeah i mean to speak that's a great point i think I mean, I, I, we do a lot of financial services work and it's a lot of numbers, you know, and some of the numbers are incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're talking like 300 trillion units mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they want that in a table. And you're like, but why? Mm -hmm. I mean, who's going to actually read that? No one, mm -hmm. no one knows. Who's going to make sense of it? And who's going to make sense of it? And mm -hmm. it's, it's unreadable. It's inaccessible just because of the sheer number, the sheer number of numbers, you know, mm -hmm. um, so it's also about approaching that from a content perspective, as you yeah. say. Now, what is relevant? Is my content actually like accessible? Never mind my, my area landmarks or whatever. Um, what am I actually giving to people? Yeah. And, and then, Tanya, I just want to mention something. You mentioned um, uh, an add-on that you would use for reading um, that, that kind of... Mm -hmm. Like, all the browsers now have those built in. I'm mm -hmm. actually... I, I won't speak for Chrome. I'm not thinking... But, Firefox and Safari and Edge, they all have built in um, reading mm. mode. Yeah. It's, a, it's a button that you can click um, near, the, near the URL, next to the URL. And you can it actually also fun. listen to that as well. It just pulls out all the text mm. and then you can also listen rather than mm. having to read it. So oh. browsers themselves are becoming well, quite, in, quite involved with, um, mm. with accessibility and, and bringing those kind of and easier experiences office suite and google suite do as well mm. they I mean, do it yes. still involves engineering but you it does yeah mm. as well Bye, so thank you in, in 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 chrome uh it's weird like you sometimes so you get uh, sometimes you get a prompt uh to it's almost similar to like kind of the pwa add to home screen prompt where it says like view simplified view um and i don't really know how it determines that uh but yeah but like there's actually a flag that you can enable to always have that option um, which i've actually enabled um, and sometimes i just prefer viewing things in simplified way view and i i think it just removes like a large part of the css um and reads it and this is one thing that i think we kind of lost with kind of the decline of like rss and and that is that kind of meant that uh, people who push stuff onto the web need to think how their content would look 
with all the styling removed. Um, yeah. I think now that yeah, our, it, it, it feels well. It, making a, is coming back. Do you think Chroma, so? Chroma building um, an RSS um, application in, into the browser. Really? Like right after they killed the best one that was ever created? <laughs> Yeah. From, uh, can can I just, Google Reader. Yeah. You retro, retro engineering. <laughs> I'm not sure if can I just share on, my screen quickly. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Tony, um, I think you could still ask while he's sharing. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to do this is Firefox. Oh, um, I the, if I click this button here. Hmm. Yeah. Just, it's exactly and then I the can same thing. Go, I can actually go and listen and it'll. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So that's actually built into the browser. Mm. I'm afraid now I have to I head off stop. as well, but it was lovely to chat and thanks for inviting me to present. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for I being look here. forward to more and I'm going to go back to one or two that I missed, but I will, yeah. Yeah, Before I to think keep we in touch on this. Yeah, we. Should, I, I, I'm definitely keen to do kind of like a longer series on this, um, specifically where we have actual people with, you know, um, I'm super keen to reach out to what, what's it the Cape Society of the Blind or what's that college there yes. in? I can Salt. I can recommend. Um, we've had some recent discussions at the Western Cape Network on Disability because the two of our board members are blind. One is deaf blind and one is blind. And the blind one, Michelle, we've gone through, we wanted to collaborate online. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things that we have to do together online. So we know that Google Meet, for example, works pretty well out of all of the meeting apps compared to the other ones for blind people. But so we thought that that would kind of mean that Google is now cool. No. Mm -hmm. Um, as soon as you go over into Google Docs, it's unnavigable for a blind person. It's like really awful. Well, I mean, even at the best of times for me to get into it, it was only the recent project that I really started getting to collaborate it, because the folder structure just doesn't look like I'm used to on a, on any any other thing. Mm -hmm. So that was that was impossible for her. Um, she, we then moved into Dropbox rather that worked better for her. Um, what was the other one? Now she's got a, a, a contract job for two years with some unit at the University of Stellenbosch and they do everything on Teams. Teams is the worst thing. And the funny thing is that, uh, that Microsoft is so vocal about their commitment to accessibility. And I think they really want to be, but they just are not. Teams is, in fact, actually, I've, I had a meeting with a client in Teams when we started out with this particular client. And for every other meeting since then, I've not been able to meet in teams. Something has gone wrong or I lose sound mm. or something awful. And we end up going over into other platforms or I just call the guy, you know, just phone mm. him on a regular phone. Um, mm. So Michelle would be, when we said that we were going to come, Natalie and I were going to come to this and I saw Erica was here tonight as well. Um, and we said, we'll see what we can pick up in terms of these things. And maybe the Microsoft guy is there, you know, this time. But Michelle would be certainly keen to chat about accessibility um, and and to, to try things and to push it into the blind community to, to test drive anything that you would want mm. to do with it. Mm. Because they are actually probably the hardest ones to have to, I suppose it does make a difference now. If, I mean, if you've got sound and if you've got sound files and you still need to have transcripts. But mm. but yeah, it's there's a lot more coding and stuff that has to go on for blind people perhaps than even just transcripts, which you can always just retype. Mm. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just, an interesting recent experience, I shared the movie link earlier. I worked on a project earlier this year, which had to be done in a big rush. It was the first thing of this nature that I'd ever been involved in. And it had a hectic deadline because the um, pop singer Sia had put out this movie with no proper consultation with disabled people. <laughs> there was a big furore going on. And we had to launch this um, short movie to kind of do damage control on the same day that she launched in America because she had originally int intended to sponsor this movie and suddenly she just like withdrew from everything. And so we were left kind of holding the baby and thinking, okay, disabled people can be harmed if we don't do something. So um, in that process, I learned, for example, about 
the kinds of captioning that you get with the, when it's like the auto captioning. I don't know if that's the right word, which which something like YouTube will do, and then you can go and edit that, or whether it's built into the movie. It's like hard coded, baked mm. in. So we yeah. went for the baked in version, but we saved a non baked. Um, one so that we could give that over and that they would do the same thing with all the language versions mm. and this is a little bit more of a longer way of doing it because there are better ways or at least there are easier ways of doing it if you if you go and select some of the google features but they're glitchy so in terms of the time limit we found that it was easier to just do a whole lot of duplication of effort rather and they are in fact i'll share this quickly with you um, this this is a, a very um, <laughs> comprehensive lot of disability accommodations in the final product um, in the sense that it has different language versions. It has an audio described version. It has a this captioned version. It has transcripts. It has everything. And those things we produced over time. So it was launched with some mistakes in, we got to get it out now. We got to get it out. We got it out on the day. And then we started adding the other versions um, afterwards and so now it has a full set of versions oh this is really cool i'll definitely and check it out one of the things that we're still working on on that is um the client which is communication first they're an american um ngo uh, for people with communication disabilities they um wanted to uh, that we write up the story of how we made this short film because everybody was saying like oh but you can't make a film with non-speaking actual people because blah 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 and you know this is why we don't involve them and she wanted us to put this out to say no we in 10 days flat we put this thing out as completely new to the film industry we did this thing we worked across borders and continents with multiple contributors and we did it with non-speaking people so it was important for them to write the story of yes this is possible you can work with these super disabled people and they can contribute mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. right. no, I've gone on yeah, for it's too long. Cool. i'll definitely check it out um but yeah i'm definitely keen to follow this up um because you know i, I think a lot of it is just uh, ignorance and I, and i mean ignorance not in a in a condescending way you know like i, I refer to just myself yeah, like myself as well, you know, like it's pretty recently that I learned for the first time that there are dialects of sign language. There, there's oh, no, yeah, yeah I, I never knew that. I thought there was just one universal sign language. Um, so things like that, you know, and obviously. And, and then there was also dialects within one, like say within mm. South African sign language, within American sign language, you have black mm. people speak differently from white people mm. in sign language. Mm, I want to mm. just, in, before we all go, because I know we're all popping out here, I want to introduce Sandra, who's here for the first time tonight. Um, Sandra is the web developer for uh, a, a site which is going to be launching soon called for the Zekwande Foundation. Zekwande is a, a non-speaking autistic um, boy. He's 14 years old, but mm. he's kind of big for his age. And he, two months ago, he said to his prince, school principal and his communication therapist that he wishes to resign from school because he knows what he wants to do with his life and he'd like to start working full time, which he is now doing. And um, running the Zekwande Foundation, which is advocating for the rights of non-speaking autistic people in Africa. So his first day on the job was on Monday and his site will launch soon and there's going to be an event. I mean, everybody's invited if you'd like to come to the online launch event. Mm. But that's Sandra. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks a lot, Tanya, for um, the introduction. And um, yeah, it's been quite an interesting um, evening. And thanks for just sharing all this information. Um, just a quick one from my side, if I may, Skull. Um, mm. That's part of the reason why I asked for um, um, email addresses. And thanks for sharing mm. that, even if it's the LinkedIn ones, because mm. I definitely think that from where we're sitting, um, this is going to have to be an ongoing sort of engagement. And mm. uh, Tanya has been very kind to take me under her wing and kind of uh, send these links to me. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, because I think that's the only way we're going to get um, some, tr again, traction is by sharing. Because like you've pointed out, Scott, some people, we generally just don't know any better. Mm. Um, and by omitting information, we are actually doing a huge disservice um, to a lot of people out there. So I'm here mm. in a learning capacity and I'm hoping that um, mm. we can actually um, get Zekwande's site um, up and running and as inclusive as possible. Uh, so mm. thanks for the opportunity and I will definitely make contact after this evening. Thank mm. you. Yeah, I've been wanting to do some collaborative thing now. I, I think I, I've told uh, Tanya like 
last year already but it's just you know like it's just when it like when you're passionate about things it's you know there's loads of things you're passionate about and like it's just yeah justin would know as well if you just look at all the that record collection behind them you know you need to you need to kind of figure out how to make time for and you know and i have a daughter coming and it's a September so it's just it's always just a question of capacity but like the the willingness to take be there I'm, I'm super I'm super keen to maybe start like doing some collaborative work with with people yeah, yeah. Like, like across the tech industry you yammel my up by more than I deserve it. my sites was actually super inaccessible inaccessible the new ones that I'm building I'm trying to do better but I'm not I'm not fixing all things <laughs> you're, no. you're a guru Tanya <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but like, I, at I least think, I put I put alt text on my on my Twitter images and I describe my images on Facebook. I mean that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I that's kind of how I ended my talk as well. I, I think we're kind of called to be patient with one another and kind of realize that it's a long journey. And I I see, you know, especially on Twitter, but you know, like everything on Twitter is weaponized. But um, like I see accessibility sometimes weaponized as 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 means to bash people over the head or publicly shame people or, or whatever, you know. So I, I think we need to be patient with ourselves as well and, and be patient with one another as well. Because um, I think what we've been doing hasn't really been helping that much, you know. I don't think I think it's it's pretty agreed upon that accessibility has gotten worse over, worse over the last decade. So I'm not sure kind of publicly shaming people and making people feel bad has been working out that well for us. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely keen to follow up on that. Um, definitely kind of send me a message um, on, on LinkedIn, uh, Sandra, and uh, we can take it from there. I'll definitely do so. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, this has been a super insightful evening for me um, and I'm definitely hoping there's gonna be coming some good stuff out of it. Um, so for those that are still around, um, uh, for our good friends at uh, Zapt, which is ZI product design, um, we'll be doing a panel discussion next week on um, ethics in digital product design. Um, I think there's definitely gonna be a lot of overlapping conversations. A lot of the same type of themes come up around inclusivity and you know, respect and, 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 and so forth. Uh, so yeah, if, if you found this interesting, definitely check out the work that they are doing. Um, I'm super keen to kind of in terms of what's gonna come out of that conversation as well. Uh, Justin, I just want to check if there's anything you maybe want to add before everyone heads out. Um, just one thing. I saw there was just a, a question from Jordan that we missed, which is around data. Mm. Um, and, you know, given the constraints of where we live and the continent we live on and expensive data, uh, mm. performance is absolutely an accessibility issue. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, so... The, the, it's something we always need that I think we didn't really talk about. Mm. Um, so I know we've been, we've been going for ages, but I just want to mention one thing in this regard. Um, today, out of interest, I went and did a performance test on the vaccination registration portal um, mm. in Chrome with Lighthouse. It's called 14 out of 100. Mm. Yeah. And if you think that the vast majority of South Africans who need to get vaccinated for COVID mm. are going to yeah. be accessing it on a mobile device, Mm. And it's a flutter application. Sure. And the, it's just a massive JavaScript file. It's completely inaccessible. Mm. Uh, and if you think this is like such a crucial thing for our, our, our citizenry right now, is being able to use that vaccination portal to register. And mm. usually only via a mobile device um, with a spotty internet connection. Um, mm. It's actually borderline criminal that it's been developed that way. Mm. So, no, for sure. Yeah, performance is a absolutely a absolutely crucial element, particularly in the con in our context. Yeah. Mm. No, for sure. If you that, was, that turned into a mini rant, I didn't mean it to. Um, no, but like you know, I, I completely hear you. As and I feel like as someone who has done a lot of work for government, you know, and you know, National Treasury, like uh, their website tables, tables all the way, tables, 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 mm. TRs, TDs, font font HTML tags everywhere, you know, B tags, 
uh, iDAGs. Yeah. Yeah, government. It's it's like a it's, 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 a, it's it, a huge accessibility yeah. nightmare. Yeah, it's a, it's a time machine. Uh, like if you just look at the code, it's like from 20 years ago. <laughs> but anyway, cool. Awesome, guys. This has been super insightful. I will hopefully have the video uploaded before the weekend. Um, yeah, and then hopefully I'll see some of you at the Zap chat tomorrow, um, next week. Otherwise, we'll hopefully... What's uh, Let me just have a, have a quick look like what the next talk is. Um, do you maybe know what, what that is, uh, Justin? We don't have one. <laughs> we have one. It's just a draft. Um, it's not published yet. Let me have a look. We have something possibly planned. Uh, we oh. do have. We haven't confirmed the dates yet, but we've got uh, Jason and Kenny from Netlify joining us uh, for a Q and A. Yeah. Um, which will probably be in June. Yeah. But we still need to iron out the dates with them. Mm. Um, and I yeah, think I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, but we'll, 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 yeah, just keep, keep an eye on the meetup channel, uh, keep an eye on our LinkedIn um, profile. Um, yeah, all the details will be there. Also, guys, have a great evening, keep warm, um, and then hopefully we'll chat again soon. Cheers.